Big change. There is another change that I'm going to talk to you about. Is this one here. The definition of short-term and long-term benefits has changed. You know what the old definition of short-term employee benefits used to say? Something as a benefit is a short-term benefit if it is due to be settled. The definition changes now to, is it expected to be settled? This makes a big difference. It makes a big difference. Where it makes a big difference with this long-term leave. <laughs> long-term leave is due next year, but you know what, you don't expect the guy to take it in the next 12 months. What, did, what this means, lot more of our benefits are going to be long-term benefits rather than short-term benefits. Now, I'll tell you what's been happening or what I understand has been happening in Pakistan is that you have been incorrectly accounting for certain leave pay accruals. However, this new standard makes your wrong treatment right. Okay, <laughs> so we early adopt, <laughs> if that's an option, all right. That's what I need to tell you about. When this is effective from 1st January 2013. All right, so that's revised IS-19, people. Not too many big changes. I'll tell you what you need to worry about. If you've been using the corridor, you've got to worry. Because what's going to happen now is you don't have that buffer of the corridor protecting you from actuarial gains and losses. The balance sheet takes the full effect of that corridor. And this one here is a big one. More benefits may, may now be long term than previously was the case. All right, that ends it for me. It says end of slideshow. I have 33 seconds left. <laughs> All right, before 8.30. Any questions? Or risk the wrath of hungry people. Carry on. <laughs> Go ahead. Let's wait for the mic, then everybody can take the advantage of your question. Right. Not a very complicated question. I just wanted to know these changes. Are these going to be applied retrospectively? Especially the part where we need to recognize all the unrecognized net actual gains and losses. Good point. The amendments are generally to be applied retrospectively. So yes, yes retrospectively. There's only two small changes. Um, this is the changes. I mean generally it's going to be a retrospective standard. It's a retrospective standard. So that means you were right all along in Pakistan. Yeah. All right, it's a retrospective standard. Any other questions? Yeah? Lift your hand up, sir. Please raise your hand so that uh, gentlemen can see that you... For that IFRS 10, uh, it is probably trying to cover the problem that entities which should have been consolidated were not consolidated before. Exactly. But how does it cater the other side of the problem? Entities which should not have been consolidated may get consolidated because it, it leaves too much on judgment. Right. Valid question. The question, if I'm going to paraphrase for everyone, it makes more entities consolidated and it also asks you to consider the rights of others. Under IS-27 we never look too much at the rights of others. So what we're going to do is in some cases we're going to have more consolidations and with some special purpose vehicles we're not going to have any more consolidation. I can think of an example now is say, for ex say you have you bought into a securitization vehicle and you set up the securitization vehicle it's a SPV, you set it up, you make all the decisions, but what happens is the bank controls everything in that vehicle. You know what, you would have previously consolidated it under SIG-12 because your business needs, your decision making is majority of benefits, but in, under the new standard you, know, you don't consolidate that because the bank controls everything. The bank has exposure, the bank has power over the variability of returns. You understand that? So you're going to get both answers. You're either going to be consolidating more or consolidating less. But I think the majority of the cases, or what the way it's written, more is going to be in on balance, more is going to be consolidated than deconsolidated. The problem with Enron, the problem with all these things is people didn't consolidate. They're not consolidating what they should be. You understand? That's the reality. Sorry, Yusuf, one more question for you. Yes, sure. Uh, as, as related to the joint ventures and joint entities you, you mentioned earlier, 
And uh, you, you just mentioned that, that there, uh, despite the fact that there are joint uh, entities, but that might, might not fall uh, with the definition of the joint ventures. Could you just a little bit explain yeah. what okay. are the... Things? All right. Well, what I said is you, you under, before, under IS-31, the moment you had a separate legal entity, the thing was a joint venture, and you either apply proportionate consolidation or equity accounting, whatever your accounting policy was. This then it says, wait a minute, before you jump to that conclusion, just wait. Is this actually a legal entity that is totally ring-fenced? Is it an entity? Or is it a, could it be looked at as like your branch? You understand that? Is it really genuinely an entity that can take external finance, has external customers? Or is it your branch or your arm? If it's your branch or your arm, it's joint, op joint operation, even though it is housed in a separate legal entity. You understand it. So what they're doing is, they're saying, wait a minute, before you jump to conclusions, just see whether this legal form or this, this legal veil here has any, has any substance to it. You understand that? All right. Most of your extractive industry companies or joint ventures don't have any external operations. They are just acting as the other arm of that foreign company. And in that case, this won't be joint venture, so they don't have to equity account for it. They will be putting in their proportionate share of assets and liabilities, as they would do. All right, so they, in, in a way, will still be achieving proportionate consolidation. So for them, there's no change. You get my point. So a lot of these extractive companies, these oil, gas companies, for them, this joint ventures that they're creating are not joint ventures, they're joint operations, and by them being joint operations, you still got to proportionately bring your assets and liabilities in. So the... Line by line. Co correct, correct. Not a proportionate consolidation, but a line by, by line, yes. Different, yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah, in front, please. Uh, Yusuf, if you've got a situation where the uh, private equity houses 45% shares and the other investors have 55% with uh, some special investor programs like you have the proxy rights uh, usually attached to the SPAs of these PPMs, mm. uh, you might end up with the voting rights with investors who don't have to consolidate because all their money went through Cayman Island companies. <laughs> so you have got 45%, somebody else has the voting rights and once again, the escape route, which we have been trying to cover for these private equity houses, never went through. Yeah, no, no, point taken. I think w what's happening here is I think the standard set had tried to close a gap, yes, sir, but right. I think the gap's still there. still there. I think there's still a structuring opportunity. But what they're trying to do is they're trying to close the gap. You, you understand? I mean, in that situation, you've got to see what's the relevant activities. If the contracts are written properly, you may find something. Who should be consolidated? You understand. But as an analysis, you go through the process. Hopefully through that process, you're getting the right person to consolidate. But yes, there's still structuring opportunity. Unfortunately, reality. I would like to ask uh, one question about this, that uh, regarding fair value. Like right. there's a government in the uh, university, and for that, uh, it has a huge, um, uh, like it has a good uh, land uh, over have it in its balance sheet. So if we going for a revaluation of it, right, for a fair value model, investment property, if that is going to be shown as an investment property, right. so uh, will that be a sufficient uh, thing that it will be a reflective of reality that investment property will moving to a high amounts and yeah, but the purpose of the government was as to be remain there for education purpose. I, if I understand, let me repeat your question and I'm hoping to see if I understand it correctly. You've got a piece of land to value it on the highest, best use. Would that be feasible? Because it's not the current use. Is that what your question is? No, like government. Government, uh, it government has some responsibilities ah, other I than see. making profit. Okay. If the government has put some, some conditions on the land, that conditions have to be taken into account in the valuation. Because if a third party has to take that land over, he will have to be subject to that same conditions. So if the government says, you can only use this land for industrial property. 
you cannot value it using residential. You understand it? Because that's a limitation. A market participant can't use it.